swirly and my thoughts are ragged. I need to find the stillness. This is a search for meaning, not for the next life, whatever that may be, but for this life, now. The sanctuary of Tupten Sholing. Since the Buddhists fled Tibet, this monastery has become one of the main centers of the Tibetan spiritual world. The 800 monks and nuns who live here are preparing for the Mani Rimdu, a celebration of compassion that represents freedom from samsara for all the sentient beings of the world. The Buddha left behind 84,000 lessons, or sutras. They are all part of the teachings of the Dharma. The sense of serenity in the prayer hall is deeply moving. The music, the rituals, the recitation of mantras, the monks and the nuns chant their prayers so consistently that it's almost as if they become the prayers themselves. You know, this is not all about the twiddling of thumbs. This is 2,500 years of scholastic vision, of, of intensity by millions of people to try to understand the nature of existence and to encode that in a set of scriptures that become like roadmaps to the path of liberation and wisdom. The scarves, or katas, that the monks and nuns throw forward represent the nature of karma, the principle of giving and receiving. They are both offerings and appeals to Trosig Rinpoche, the abbot of Topten Sholing, a teacher of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and one of the most revered enlightened beings in the Buddhist world. The Rinpoche means the blessed one, not the human being, but the man who has become one with the teachings. He is both teacher and teachings. He is the embodiment of the Buddha path, not because of his own sense of ego, but because he has transcended ego and become one with the essence of the Buddhist practice. Tukten Sholing has grown so much that they have had to build a new central temple and quarters for the additional monks and nuns. We have an audience with Rinpoche, and it's a little daunting. I've spent my life obtaining knowledge through university and field studies, but the Rinpoche has spent his lifetime achieving wisdom and enlightenment through contemplative practice. You know, the first time I was in the presence of Tulsa Rinpoche was three years ago when I visited Chopin Sholin um, Monastery, and I was working on, a, on, a, on another project, and I had a whole list of specific questions that I was planning to ask him. When I came into this room with all these questions, uh, I forgot all the questions, and I started to cry and tears came down the corners of my eyes. And, you know, coming from the background that I come from, you know, men don't cry, and they certainly don't cry easily. And these weren't sobs of, of, of the kind of tears you get when you're, you know, you're saddened by the death of a father. These were kind of tears of just spontaneous delight that were just pouring forth from my eyes. And all the questions that I had planned to ask him were simply evaporated. And I just felt this kind of charismatic presence. Now we come back to, to make a story of the essence of Buddhism, to try to bring that story to the West and the, the science of the mind that is the Buddhist tradition. Mm 
so before you forward your question, mm -hmm. so if you like, you can bring now. <laughs> <laughs> well, our question now is... is asking Trulsa Rinpoche about Buddhism is a little like asking St. Peter about the Bible. There are few minds as bright and clear on the planet. But I'll have time for my questions. Rinpoche will be coming with us to the Mani Rimdu festival at Shiwang, a monastery not far from here by helicopter. So we make ready to leave. There are tens of thousands of people in this part of the world who would give their eye tooth to spend one moment in the presence of Tulsa Rinpoche. And we were blessed by him. He is the embodiment. He is a 33rd reincarnation of the most foremost disciple of the Buddha. He represents all of that Buddhist lineage. And the point of Buddhism is not simply to, you know, clear the mind, still the lake, and all those wonderful metaphors. It's to embrace compassion. It's to be compassion. Rinpoche is living proof that compassion can be achieved as a state of being. The contemplative practice will result in serenity and enlightenment. This is what we mean by a Buddhist science of the mind. It is the empirical pursuit of the truth. But the amazing thing for me is the realization that there really is a path that can lead to a transformation of the mind and spirit. When we speak of a Buddhist science of the mind, we are talking about a philosophy developed by an Indian prince named Siddhartha, who achieved enlightenment under a Bodhi tree. Siddhartha became the Buddha. Monasteries like Tutan Sholin, the one we just left, and this one, Shiwang, are repositories of Tibetan Buddhist thought. The trouble these days is that Shiwang in particular is vulnerable. There has been a Maoist uprising in Nepal for the last decade, and almost all of the Chiwang monks have fled harassment for the safety of Tutan Sholin. Now only eight stay here full time. But this is a time of year when Chiwang comes to life again. Tibetan pilgrims, Sherpas and dignitaries all come here for the Mani Rimdu. The Mani Rindu is a ritual recreation that celebrates the arrival of Buddhism in Tibet from India. Prosa Rinpoche says that to experience the Mani Rindu is to receive a blessing. The prayers before the pageantry of the festival connect to the very essence of Buddhism. The fundamental idea is that everyone has a potential for inner transformation. We all have our own perfect jewel buried deep in the earth.